PC Perspective videos and podcasts are sponsored by Be Quiet and the all-new PureBase 500DX case. Featuring three PureWings 240mm fans, ARGB lighting, and USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C connectivity, the PureBase 500DX is optimized for maximum airflow with a sleek yet elegant design. Available now in black and white. Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 590 being recorded Thursday, June 11th, 2020. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrus. I'm Sebastian Peak. And I'm Brett Van Spruenberg. And we're glad you could join Everybody's us. A little, bit, oh. a little bit quicker that time. Yes, we're getting well, better. it was until just now. Getting better. Mm. <laughs> hey, well, we, we got practiced last time. There was a discussion. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're glad you could join us. We record a live episode of our tech podcast here once a week, Wednesdays or Thursdays. And if you want to know when we are going to record those, join our mailing list, pcpro.com slash subscribe, where we let you know ahead of time when the show is going to be. Uh, also, uh, be sure to head over to patreon.com slash pcpro, where you can uh, contribute directly to helping the site here. Every dollar you spend there goes to hosting the, you know, hosting the uh, servers and uh, paying the crew here for their contributions to the site. So we really appreciate that. And if you uh, become a new patron during the week and you want to have a message sent to us, uh, just let us know. Uh, we can, you can either change your name field or send me a message after the fact. And we had one new patron this week, and it is um, forgot already. Sorry, George George Keel. George Keel became a patron a few days ago. So thank you, George, and uh, thanks to everyone who's been part of that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, all right. Well, it is. Uh, Let's see. It's not a Wednesday, but Josh has his burger on Wednesday. So we'll take a trip back in time to yesterday and ask Josh, what did he have yesterday? Uh, this one's called the Hayfire. It's a uh, chipotle mayo with uh, fresh cut jalapenos. Um, trying to pepper jack cheese. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice tang to it. It's not the most impressive looking burger. I kind of scrunched it and put it together and thought, well, maybe I should take a picture. And I did. It was Wednesday, and it was good. It filled me up for a day. Didn't eat 24 hours. Again, it's great. All right. Well, we Intermittent get... fasting by design. Right. We've, we've got to come up with a rating system for Josh so that people who yeah. stop in, they can, they can get some semblance of you know, just how good yeah. it was. How about that... a burger rating? Like one to ten burgers. How many burgers would you give your burger on Wednesday? We yep. rate burgers. Is it seven, maybe? Burgers oh, really? out of town. Okay. You can yeah. pop the little burger pictures up on the screen underneath them as he goes. <laughs> pop, 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 yeah. pop, I like it. Four four popping burgers. Hey, I like the uh, the look of those serrated pickles as well. Nice chop there. Yeah. Yeah, it's all good yeah. stuff. Yep. Very good presentation. And, of course, this is at <laughs> yep. Josh's favorite restaurant, uh, Born in a Barn in Laramie, Wyoming. So make sure if you're passing through. Stop and tell, tell him, him to Josh. sponsor us. I mean, uh, have a burger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell him Josh sent you. He did give it to me for free this last time. Ooh. No way. Like, no, nah, that's on me, man. It's like, all right. Awesome. Hey. Is, he, is he watched like the, the podcast? I don't think so. Well, get him. Or has he just known him? you for decades? <laughs> He's known me for a few years now. <laughs> we need to get the show running on a loop on the TVs in the restaurant. Anyway, well, let's get into the news this week. We've got a big story that happened just a few hours ago, a surprising story. Uh, Jim Keller, a uh, decorated veteran of the industry. He's been everywhere. He's done everything. Uh, most recently since 2018, been working at Intel. And he left abruptly today. Uh, they, Intel published a uh, statement. We got an article here from PC World discussing it, but Intel had a blog post on it as well. Uh, they cited personal reasons uh, that he, he has departed. And uh, that, could, you know, personal reasons in this industry, in any industry, could be a cover for disagreements or anything. But considering his track record and how he is generally, when he does leave companies, he, does, he sticks by until like a major project is finished. Uh, it is uh, an unusual step for him uh, at Intel. So uh, on, from, you know, to him personally, we're all hoping for the best, wishing for the best, um, hope nothing's too wrong. Uh, but then on Intel side, from a practical standpoint, they've had to now restructure they've had to to mm -hmm. kind of uh scramble to fill the hole that he's going to leave there raja is still going to be in charge of the overall architecture roadmap and uh and then some other key uh, players have moved into different roles in intel and he's, he's also going to be 
uh, contract guy for the next six months to help yeah. move things along. So, I mean, you kind of think it's not a personal issue. It's not, well, I mean, it's personal for him. I think it's, it's probably, a, there's some health issue with himself or, or a close family member. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, usually if, if there's some kind of, you know, cloud of unhappiness around them, they don't keep them on for six months to, to keep uh, the process rolling. So, yeah, it, it kind of sounds like it may be uh, uh, some kind of health issue of, of him or self or those around him. And so we, we obviously wish him the best. Yeah. And every time, you know, major players like this come up, I, I put together a, a slide we can look at that just kind of highlights for people unfamiliar with him, just where where he's been involved. And so we've, and I. As I was making this, it's, it, I realized as I finished it, it sounds more like an obituary, which is not my intention. He's still alive well, as far as we know, in terms of, yeah. you know, at least for the next six months. But just for those who don't know, uh, looking back at Jim Keller's impact on this industry, I couldn't find an exact start date, but at some point in the early 90s, he started at DEC and he worked on the Alpha Series processors. In 1998, he went to AMD for the first time and was uh, there for the launch of the K7, development of the K8, other major contributions while at AMD was working on the x86-64 instruction set and the hypertransport uh, uh, technology. Then he went to Cybite in 99, uh, which then was quickly, right after he was there, brought by Broadcom. And at that point, he was working on processors for gigabit networking technology. Left, went in 2004 to PA Semi, uh, which at that time was still independent. He was working on low-power mobile SOCs. They got bought by Apple. Uh, actually, what happened was he first went to Apple and then Apple, like within a couple months, bought PA Semi, brought his team over with him. Um, mm -hmm. And while there, he worked on the uh, A4 and A5, which is, you know, the, the beginning of when Apple really started to become a power player in their own custom ARM chips, which we'll talk about later in the show. Uh, then in 2012, he went to AMD uh, for the second time and worked on K12 and the, the beginning parts of the Zen architecture. He was there when AMD made this really important shift to this new Zen, Zen architecture. Went to Tesla for a couple of years, worked on their autopilot system, and then in 2018 went to Intel, where he's been working on uh, all of their architecture roadmap, trying to turn the company around. Uh, and then, of course, he left. Uh, well, again, like as Josh said, he's going to stay on as an advisor for six months, but he's he's out as a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, role. And uh, Patrick Moorhead over at More Insights and Strategy uh, issued a statement. Uh, he said, you know, Jim Keller's a rock star, it's a quote, and uh, Intel is losing a great architect. Historically, Keller has left after a specific milestone, like he did at Apple, Tesla, and AMD. I don't have insights into his personal reasons for leaving, but I hope he's okay. For Intel, the company has a deep bench, and it's a place where architects want to work. End quote. That said, the general feeling is, this is a loss for Intel, no question. Mm -hmm. uh, Keller is very talented, very accomplished, so uh, not, not good for whatever the reason is behind it. Uh, any other thoughts, guys? Well, well, can I mean, we bring that assuming... slide back up for just a moment? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, you know. so I just wanted to point out that before the 1990s at DEC, he, he worked closely with George Lucas. Uh, he was uh, Luke Skywalker in the original Star Wars trilogy. And uh, that's all. Then went on to do the Hercules series with uh, yeah. what's his yes, face? Kevin Sorbo. It, yeah, yeah. It, that was his stage name was Kevin Sorbo for a while. But yep. you know. mm -hmm. And God, did he ever used to look like him too. Like, And Josh can attest to that. He was He's a pretty yeah, built guy. Yeah. yeah. He's but no, assuming everything works out well for him, uh, and we, as we said, we really do hope that we do. The, the question becomes, where will he end up next? Is he going to look at going back to Apple, who is, you know, as we'll talk about later, starting to do something a little interesting, try something new, like with ARM or Samsung, you know, he, with the what he's done over the years, you know, everyone's going to want him. Uh, he's he's helped spearhead some huge developments uh, in the computing world and you know he's played as we pointed out with just about all of the major players so far going so you know what what might he be doing next yeah and then that'll be interesting again assuming that it's not a, a, a debilitating health issue that he's looking to retire because he could, he could easily retire at this point with the mm. amount of money he's made over the years but yeah, he works be... for love i think at this point sure <laughs> Speaking Paul's of got love, a few important uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop just a few. You, sorry. Oh, okay, uh, I'm not sure where Sebastian was about to go. Well, it, it, just looking at our Discord chat, and uh, I I admire this is probably the best streaming setup I've ever seen. Somebody's uh, who likes our podcast is has set it up in a very special way this evening. It is yes, very recommended. 
Yeah. Oh, I, I think it's on battery, so it might be okay. Is it okay? I didn't see For any audio power listeners. Lines. Well, that plus the phone it's, he's obviously got. I mean, yeah, yeah. can't see it's, the toaster off screen. Of a, of a laptop <laughs> perched precariously on the corner of a bathtub, which is full of hot water and bubbles. It looks like right. I don't. I don't see any still body running. parts, so that's good. Yep. Yeah. Still, still early in the night. PG thirteen. Yeah. Is, 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 there's no is that a whirlpool or just bubbles? Uh, I think it's bubbles. I think it's just. It's, I think it's just bath. Just, just it's generous. Are bubbles. there bubbles? We have to, we'll ask. Generous. Well, I'd say <laughs> that that would be the beginning of a challenge to our audience to share with us the most creative ways to watch the PC. God, podcast. no! Please don't. Please that keep will, it G-rated. Well, uh, that it. that will end in lawsuits and jail time. Yeah, um, exactly. So, uh, uh, so, yeah, the message attached to this was, "At Sebastian, I pretend you can see me through the webcam." So. <laughs> Uh, blocked. Yep. 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 Well, hey, yeah, at I, least the YouTube chat is wondering where Peter North is. On that note, mm. yeah, he has not shown up this week, as far as I've no, seen. No, not yet. So, mm. Mm. so there's he, uh, he, another bathing bathing opportunity. He's more of a you know, Wednesday guy. I, I've noticed. Ah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, all right. So uh, any anybody else have any final thoughts thoughts on Jim Keller? No. Okay. So we'll no. we'll. Pay attention, see what happens there. We'll have a link yeah. uh, if you're interested to the Intel blog post that lists all the people who are going to step into these new roles to fill to fill his role. I think it takes four of them. So are uh, any of them us? No, none of them are us or Damn any it. of our dear departed colleagues. Uh, nobody. <laughs> these are all all the technical, most of them long-standing Intel employees that are there. So, all right. Well, let's let's check out our second story. Uh, this is uh, the least kept secret in the industry. Is we you know Apple's going to move. Their, their Macs to ARM based processors, the same basic uh, in house custom design chips that they've been using in their iOS devices for years. And we've been hearing that forever. And, and here we go. Uh, Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg this week announced that, that they're going, Apple's going to finally officially make this statement at WWDC. It's the virtual WWDC keynote coming up, uh, I think on Monday, the 22nd uh, of this month. So, uh, he, you know, Mark was a longtime Apple insider. He worked for um, 9 to 5 Mac, went to Bloomberg a few years ago. Very well connected. I will say, though, he's made an article like this. He's written an article like this several times uh, in the last five years, uh, citing a future date, none of which have come to pass. So this time, though, I think with the timing, seeing that other companies like Microsoft are moving to use ARM-based chips as well, uh, it's probably, this is, we will likely see this happen. The Macs won't ship, though, until next year. They're going to make the announcement this uh, this month at WWDC, and we'll start seeing those first Macs come after developers have had a few months of lead time to prep. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, the fact they're calling it Kalamata means that I immediately start thinking quarantini. Why not olives? It, it's Kalamata olive. You know, they wouldn't be the first to release, obviously, laptops, as you were talking about with Microsoft and the X, the Surface X, Surface Pro X, um, Lenovo, and who else? Uh, somebody, at least one, uh, one other company has released uh, ARM-based laptops, but the rumor is, is that Microsoft. they're going <laughs> to... The rumor is, is that they're going to do three chips, and it's based on their uh, iPhone A14, which was, uh, I think... Uh, uh, it had eight cores total, four high performance cores, four lower performance cores. I think they're talking about them in their code names as like uh, something to do with fire and ice. At least that's out of that article there. Fire side is obviously going to be the high draw, high performance side, and the uh, ice side being the lower performance. I'm moving a window, I'm not rendering a video kind of side. Um, and uh, they're probably not going to be direct um, uh, same chips that they're putting in the iOS. They've got so much more thermal envelope to play with and so much more power draw uh, akin uh, to thermals to play around with. They're going to be uh, higher performance if this could actually does come to pass this time around. Uh, but they're coming out with three chips and it makes sense um, you know, to, to hit their laptop line first. But uh, fear not for, uh, for Intel uh, lovers or likers. Uh, they're probably going to be continuing with that for years. I mean, they just brought out their pro not that long ago. And that's definitely a, a high end area that they can't hit with their arm chips yet. Uh, despite what the, the arm people are, are turning up their the wick on and their latest stuff. So 
I, I think you're going to see Intel soldier on for a bunch of years here uh, for a while. Um, but ultimately, you know, what does this say about the uh, abil- Intel's ability to keep up with where Apple wanted to go? A lot of people said that they should have uh, switched to AMD uh, a little while ago, but uh, clearly they had their own plans. This has probably been in the works since 2017 or around there or earlier time frame. I think back in the A12 or A10 era is when they first started playing around with, rumor was, Mac OS on their A-series. And Brett, think yeah. about the Mac Pro platform, which they've yeah. updated exactly once in seven years. It's well, a, they, basically you can a to- blame Intel's roadmap, right? Well, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, they they, they missed no, a couple right. upgrades right. along the way between 2013 and 2020. I'm, I'm but, just playing Mac fanboy on that one. So go ahead. Well, yeah, it's just obviously they won't go all arm immediately. They'll no. probably start with a notebook. Yeah, that'll basically be a, a hinged. Track pad and keyboard attached uh, iPad Pro at that point. Well, but it's going to be Mac OS. So that's that's pretty clear. It's it's not going to be iPad OS. It's going to be Mac OS on arm. Mac OS on arm with serious software limitations. Sorry, Josh. I agree with you. Uh, yeah. About a decade ago, we we'd kind of talked about this, especially in, and we were looking at the console makers. We thought, OK, there's still kind of a handheld market and all of those are pretty much arm based. Why don't they just go arm across the board? I mean, they've got handhelds, they've, they've got consoles. And so there was a lot of thought that that arm was going to be powering a lot of these next generation consoles. Well, it doesn't turn out to be the case because. AMD had a product and, and a system that uh, really worked in the favor of, of Sony and Microsoft. But, you know, the idea of simplifying your code base and your application base and, and how you do the sales of that and, and just all the administrative stuff in the background, um, it makes sense to go to one software stack. Rather than have you know we've got all you know ARM based uh, iOS stuff for for handhelds and tablets, and then you go up the very you you have to you know have a different code base for your for your OS uh, and all the applications that run on that because it's all an Intel architecture um, x86 64, and so it it makes sense if, especially the following and the customers that Apple has they can kind of maneuver around this question a whole lot better than other people. I mean, Microsoft is dif- dipping their, their toes in the arm place, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's still pretty niche. And uh, with this, I, I think they're probably going to see Apple go in a little bit harder and uh, they may lean on uh, arm some more to get, you know, a little bit more support, maybe pay extra, Maybe, you know, do some of the concepts in the Cortex uh, X1 and uh, beyond, uh, which, of course, is already being worked on by by ARM and its partners. So it's uh, I think it, eventually they're, they're going to go top to bottom ARM because, unfortunately, Intel was never able to get mobile stuff right. I mean, they had decent products, but not great and certainly not really competitive in terms of, of power consumption to what ARM had to offer at the time. And they just kind of left that to arm to ship billions upon billions of devices uh, with uh, with their technology in there instead of Intel. Think it's going to be the thinness that they can bring to the laptops with yes. arm yes. inside. Imagine, yes. if you will, only four and a half millimeters of hand-pressed aluminum. I'm sorry, aluminum in a laptop yes. base. With a dongle, so that your lightning connector can fit, because it is thicker. <laughs> uh, but there, there's no such thing as a clean break in tech anymore. And this is what I'm sort of looking at, because I agree with Josh that it, it makes sense for them to go 100% ARM, because they are they make their more of their money off of the mobile side of it, and Intel has all but given up on it. Uh, you know, they sort of sold what they had left to Apple uh, and and Qualcomm, but there's no such thing as a clean break. There's no way that they can immediately do a a turnover from an Intel based architecture to an arm based architecture without some overlap period. If even just for the simple fact that Apple care exists, so you're going to have to keep producing those pieces of hardware to be able to replace stuff that's been covered under your 
what you call a warranty anyways. And, you know, businesses are not going to immediately want to switch because it, it, chances are that software licensing is going to change with that as well. And God only knows if this is a time that Adobe's like, Oh, remember how we were talking about per core licensing? Yeah. That, that uh, seems like a good opportunity now. It, it's this six month, one year, two year crossover period. That is like, that's where they're really, they're going to bite the bullet and go for it and push it really hard. Or they're going to go wishy washy. And I don't think that's going to work out well. It doesn't tend to for any other company. Yeah, I mean, we've uh-huh. seen we've seen this. They, this is the roadmap that they had for uh, switch from PowerPC to Intel in two thousand five, right? And that went so smoothly. Well, it actually did. I mean, for it's the most not bad. part, it was not a bad transition. Uh, there was a yeah. lot of issues. The, the biggest hurdle they faced was emulation, and they had this yeah. this technology layer called Rosetta that allowed PowerPC code to run on Intel uh, processors, and it did work. The problem was a mm-hmm. performance hit. And, it, yeah. and also, you a, know, a couple, little applications like Adobe Photoshop that had to run through an emulation layer. Right. And took and a because huge there was no hit. Picking on yeah, Adobe isn't fair what, because seven. It was over a year. Yeah. It was well yeah. over a year. Yeah. The first Intel Adobe 06. Adobe is a special case here because they almost write their own operating system code around some of their applications, their own window handling code. So their stuff tends to hurt more, no matter how well it's in popular or how commonly in use it is. Their stuff tends to hurt more simply because of just the way that it's used and what it is that they actually do to build up their stuff. They tend to reinvent a lot of OS things, memory handling, window handling stuff, and they get hurt more on these transitions, unfortunately, just because of the way they code their stuff. It's yeah, delicate. It's a, it was a big, complicated, legacy build application, yes. and those are hard. Although they're fair, you know, with their model now of subscription, constant regular updates, and already looking to put stuff on iOS and on ARM or Windows. You know, they're, they're, I don't know, I doubt it'll take as long this time to get a native app. It may not be ready day one, mm-hmm. but it probably won't be a year plus wait. They've already ported a lot of their basic code to iPad. You can already mm-hmm. get a lot of their apps yeah. on I- iPad OS. So they're already pretty familiar with their core stuff on ARM. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but that, so and are that you really is- willing to bail on the, the big desktops and the, the, the pro iMacs just to focus on the mobile stuff? Mm-hmm. Right. But although now you've got Photoshop on mobile, I guess. So, but nobody likes that. From, oh I'm, God. No. I'm told, but it, it, it is interesting seeing because that this, the challenge of the emulation, we saw it with Rosetta in 2006, or we've seen it already windows on arm on the devices, Microsoft has shipped with its partners or itself that have ARM processors and have to use uh, emulation. It's hard and it doesn't work well. And one of the biggest complaints for these surface devices that are arm powered is that like Chrome sucked because Chrome wasn't natively available and the performance <clears> of Chrome <throat> through that emulator was terrible. And that's, that's yep. the most important app for most. people. So we're going to have this period where it's this, this growing pain and this frustration. And, uh, and, and yeah, I don't, I expect, I expect we will see, there will probably be YouTube videos galore comparing shot for shot, how they describe the transition in 2005 <laughs> and how they oh, yeah. describe it in 2020. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not, it's not a bad move, you know, as long as they pledge support for the systems with Intel that they're going to ship between then and now, uh, most people understand, you know, you're not, none of us, I don't think are going to want to run out for our personal systems and buy the first gen ARM Mac. It's going to be underpowered. It may be buggy. <laughs> it's going to have software and compatibility limits, but if I do, it's a cry for help. help. Right. <laughs> because it's so thin, you can just use it as a, like a blade and just hit yourself yes, in the head. It, you can slice your lunch meat with it. An all new Apple guillotine. <laughs> my, my concern, though, also is compatibility in terms of looking. So Apple prepped this. They've been doing their behind-the-scenes engineering for how many years? And then on the software side, they're prepping it on the OS with Catalina. Where well, Catalina and the last couple of versions where they've slowly taken away your ability to run 32-bit apps, run unsigned extensions, run unapproved applications. They're slowly prepping each year, locking their users into a system that will be very easy to switch over with these universal binaries. And uh, that isn't a future I want to see on the Mac. I still do use a Mac. Catalina has been a nightmare. I hate it. 
Yeah. I, I hate Catalina. Quote, Jim Tannis, a piece of perspective. I hate Catalina. And Quote. it's take that to the whole ecosystem eventually. And it's, it's going to feel restrictive. The stuff that Apple approves is going to run great. I have no doubt. It's going to have great battery life, great thermals, great performance, but only on what Tim Cook and his team designate is going to be allowed to run. And that's the long-term fear. And at that point, what's the difference between an iPad and a, and a MacBook? One comes to the keyboard. Uh, yes. One comes to the keyboard. That, well, I, I don't want to put it past them though. They'll have the Mac display <laughs> that then has a three hundred dollar external keyboard add on that you have to buy, just like on the iPad. Kind of already got and a fifteen hundred dollar keyboard mount. Right. Now, now, now you're just making stuff up. <laughs> um, oh, you're right. It'd be wheels, wouldn't it? It's the wheels. You, if you want your keyboard on wheels, or maybe it's magnetic levitation or something. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any other, Damn it. You guys, any other thoughts on on this Apple transition? What do you guys think? Anything? End of Hackintosh. Uh, yes. Uh, another long-term implication is this will probably make Hackintoshes, if not impossible, much, much more difficult. But mm. uh, Okay. Next up, we've got another story. Uh, this, this all started with a Tom's hardware. Or actually, no, it started with an update to hardware info, the, uh, the utility that allows people to monitor their system and everything. They, they released an update. I think I've got, uh, actually, I don't have it. Uh, they released an update a few days ago that gave people with AMD motherboards insight into how the motherboard was reporting processor usage to the CPU. And it was under reporting it in some cases. So this isn't every uh, motherboard. It's some motherboards from some manufacturers. It was under reporting what the actual power draw was. And the problem as, as the uh, Tom's hardware article, although it is a bit sensationalist here, as it attempted to, to, to talk about was if you're, the processor does its boosting. It's all the processors today from all from Intel and AMD. They do their own internal boosting, even at stock. It's gonna, you know, automatically up and down clock as needed and, and manage its power automatically. But it, but it relies on what the motherboard's telling it to know how much room I have, how much power am I using, and how much room do I have to ramp up. And if the motherboard is saying, "Oh, you've only used fifty percent of what you've actually used," the processor thinks I've got more room and it runs hotter. And what the end case there is that you've got. In a what someone may consider to be a stock configuration, because they don't want to overclock for stability or longevity or whatever, they don't want to overclock. And and the effect is from a heat and power perspective, it is it is overclocking itself. And the reason motherboard companies are doing this is because it gives their motherboards an edge. This isn't disclosed publicly. It wasn't something they advertise. AMD says don't do this, please. But some companies did. And then when you benchmark their motherboards, like if Mori does a motherboard review for us on an X570 board. And one is better than the other in Cinebench. That might be your reason that they're doing this. Mm -hmm. But this isn't as big of a problem as that Tom's headline made it out to be. Not did, even close. Did they modify the motherboard and take the heat sink off the processor to prove it could burst into flames again? Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, they didn't again. go that far. But okay. uh, at least this time, as far as I saw. But this, this generated a lot of controversy. There was uh, an, a response article from Anon Tech, uh, Dr. Ian Cutris there. He had an article quickly up. And this is interesting because uh, Anon Tech and Tom's are both owned by the same parent publisher. It's like, mommy and daddy are fighting. Um, mm. And the, Oh, yeah. He took Tom's to task on Twitter, yes. I think, before his article went up. That I saw. Yeah. There was a flurry of, of Twitter activity from multiple parties. And... Uh, and then Gamers Nexus got in there and did a video. Uh, we'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes if you want to read through the, the process of how this all went down. Uh, AMD then uh, issued a response. I've got a, a statement here from AMD. So this is what they sent to Tom's Hardware just this morning. Quote, we are aware of the reports claiming that select motherboards may be underreporting certain power tele telemetry data that could alter the performance and or behavior of AMD Ryzen processors under certain conditions. We are looking into the accuracy of these reports. We want to be clear with our customers. AMD Ryzen processors contain a diverse array of internal safeguards that operate independently of external data sources. These safeguards enforce the safety and reliability of the processor during stock operation. Based on our initial assessment, we do not believe that altering external telemetry in the manner described by those public records or public reports would have a material impact on the longevity or safety of a user's processor. And that's a lot of PR talk, but the point is, yeah, they're, they're right. The, the conclusion that many people have come to is that you're right. From almost everybody, this isn't a big deal. If it is going to have an impact, if it is going to cause electro, or electro migration 
as the non-tech article goes in to talk about, and as the Gamers Nexus stuff talked about, it's a minor amount over years. So if this is a problem, you're talking about a few percentage points degradation in performance over years, five, 10 years, outside the warranty period, outside the likely use uh, usability of, of what you would use if you were someone interested or concerned about this. You're probably upgrading more frequently. So I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think about this uh, little kerfuffle? Yeah, it's pretty sensational. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. we don't know all of the long-term uh, properties of TSMC's 7 nanometer just because obviously it's still pretty new, but they have a lot of experience in the process uh, work. I mean, if you remember back, I think around 130 nanometer to 90 nanometer, that they had this this migrating void problem where a chip would be running fine and then for some reason in, in, internal to the uh, metal layers, a void would, would migrate through and uh, it would it would essentially kind of disassemble a, a transistor and, and it would uh, cause errors and, and oftentimes would, you know, it would break, break the entire thing. But um, they solved that. They've solved other things. And yeah, I think that it would be, if they applied something like this and you were running it 24 hours a day at full load, you know, you might expect a CPU to, to die a year earlier than expected. But it's, you know, most, most customers don't run it like that. And most enterprise stuff, you know, will replace it after five years. And it's, I mean, these are things that are designed to last this long and they do a tremendous amount of testing and, uh, they probably wouldn't have released it in the state it was if, if it was dying after like a year, which, you know, if you remember the 250 nanometer K6 series, which in K6 two would just die for no particularly mm-hmm. good reason um this is this is probably not the case i mean yeah i could be wrong but uh, all the evidence kind of points to it being uh kind of a a sensationalized issue that again is not going to affect the the average user and i mean if they've got their processor still running in five years which is easily could happen considering the last 10 years of products from amd and intel um yeah, I, I don't think that you're going to run into an issue. You're going to have problems probably with your motherboard and power supply well before your CPU decides to die. Yeah, it seems weird that, well, the architecture itself has gotten significantly more complex and smaller. Uh, they, they seem to have designed it so that electronic migration is just not a thing you really see anymore, or void migration for that matter, uh, being, you know, sort of a flip side of the coin, which, you know, is it kind of interesting in a way that they figured this out back in those days because you know people were rightfully upset that it died because back then you kept your processor going for a little bit longer than you do nowadays uh on the other hand i think this is a well-known secret and i'm not going to say that amd is the only one that does that because well I'd be lying to you, uh, but you're looking at the exact same architecture, the exact same chip, the exact same motherboard uh, chipset. You don't have a funky Northbridge, Southbridge that you can tweak a little bit to make it different. An X570 is an X570. So if you're starting to see differences, either they've used different components, which will be on the list, or they're feeding it more power. It's the way the things work. Uh, despite the seeming irregularity of of changing this value in the motherboard so that the known algorithm inside the CPU actually ran a different uh, power multiplier and seemingly would attempt to draw more power and gain higher performance, Steve or uh, Tech Jesus, you know, whoever we want to, uh, actually found out that it really wasn't the case. And there's other mitigating, <laughs> other mitigating uh, mechanisms <laughs> inside the CPU that don't allow it to seemingly take advantage of the attempt to get the CPU to draw more power, in all honesty. Uh, What they found during actual testing was that uh, it really didn't make a whole lot of difference from a clock speed or performance perspective, and that their margin of observed versus reported error of in that six to seven percent range was like yeah that's probably okay and there are only a few that they found that were really um blatant from a uh kind of a, a release perspective like 
if they were trying to do what you implied they were trying to do, which they probably were from a motherboard manufacturer perspective to say, hey, let's, you know, maybe boost our board's performance in reviews, it really didn't have that much of an effect is the bottom line. Yeah. And as Jeremy said a moment ago too, uh, the big response to it is, yes, Intel does do this too. On the Intel's yeah. case though, it's a, <laughs> it's a uh, sanctioned me- uh, method, meaning Intel says we are built our processors Fair. to take, take advantage of this. We're warranted for this. Uh, whereas on the AMD side, this exploit or whatever you want to call it does exist, but it's not an official thing. The AMD has explicitly in the past, from what I've been told, told motherboards manufacturers not to do this. But uh, and then as Brett said, it's not a huge difference. It's not going to, it's not doubling the power draw. It's, you know, we're talking a, a 25, 30 additional Watts, a few percentage points, more performance. And again, from just keep your processor cool, use a good cooler. And even if you're running way of you know, 24 seven, insane workloads, the long-term damage is, is not, it's going to be years down the road and it's not just going to stop working. It just might suddenly start requiring a little more voltage to hit those stock speeds. Again, we're talking single digit percentages. So, this is oh, not this is only observable at 100 percent as well. Yes, yes. Oh, gotcha. So, I mean, I mean, standard day to day operations of what it is you're doing outside of like I'm, you know, rendering a video or you know, doing something that's going to nail all the cores at 100 percent. This isn't even, isn't even going to make any difference. So, you know, sensationalized over the top on this. It doesn't help that these processors send to launched with the hot BIOS, basically. If you look at what mm-hmm. Ajisa mm-hmm. 1002 oh, yeah. was, Fair. Yeah. where the CPUs were yep. allowed to spike up to 1.5 volts for seemingly unlimited periods of time. They were only thermally constrained at that point. All of the Blender benchmarks, everything that sent a bench, anything anybody had in their reviews at launch was overclocked, essentially, because subsequent Ajisa updates lowered that. Like the very first one, 003 comes out, and it was capped at like 1.44, 1.45 volts all of a sudden. And all of those numbers dropped. And I don't, I'm, I don't claim to be an expert on CPU architecture. I don't know how feasible it is to run 1.5 volts on 7 nanometers across this many cores at 100% well, low. Does anybody at this point? Right. So to, they obviously <laughs> felt like they had to lower it. In fact, they lowered it so much initially that there were stories being written about this. And, you know, this this huge drop in, in voltage and sustained clocks and certain processors not hitting their claimed boost clocks. And then they sent out another revised Ajisa version, which kind of was the halfway point between 002 and 003. And that's kind of where they've been since then where the boost behavior was adjusted, but I still don't see those higher voltages anymore. You don't really go up over 1.45 volts. Uh, and you absolutely were. If you still ha- if you have a board that could run 002, it's kind of crazy to look at the difference in boost behavior and voltage from pre-release BIOS up until uh, like the final consumer version of the BIOS. It, it definitely felt like a beta launch when it came out last July. And there's all these unanswered questions about longevity and Intel, I'm sure, would love to point to longevity concerns because they don't have an answer right now. But it, I just, I look at a story like this, obviously it was sensationalized. Tom's is, is the, the graphic they use, the title they use is, is to generate clicks. But it seems like arguments in, on both sides are just conjecture at this point because we don't have any data. We get, this is so new. AMD could have hit the ball out of the park and it's perfect and it'll work for 10 years and there's no repercussions. I'm just curious to see what the market's going to look like for these processors on eBay in a decade. <laughs> uh, are there going to be issues with them? Like I look askance at any i7-920 and like how long was that overclock and at what voltage? So who knows? Hey, I think one thing we did learn from this is that the readings that things like hardware info are taking off of the board might be lies. Right. And that's well, clock think speed. Think about the, the very, when Zen power launched, usage. it was the, remember the, um, what was it called? The thermal, uh, certain processors had a disparity between the the, the temperature that was actually displayed and what it and what it really was and it wasn't right. every one of them i think it was the 1700 and a couple others i can't remember the term for it now 
but they didn't accurately report temps necessarily. And they, they gave some protracted explanation of why they did this. And of course I sound like an idiot cause I can't remember the, what the freaking term was that they use, but it was like the vol- temperature offset, I think is what they called it. And it, that kind of stuff just bothered me because back then I was still doing case and cooler reviews full time and I wanted to jump on board with Ryzen and the Ryzen system I could afford to buy fell into that range of, oh, this is using an offset. So I don't even get the true temperature readout. And I I didn't trust their processors anyway for for strictly thermal testing because back in the bulldozer era, I think I had an 8370 that I experimented with using. and. The way that that would internally downclock to meet a certain once a certain thermal limit had been reached, I would watch the performance monitor and it was like a like a seesaw. It would hit four gigahertz and drop and up and down and up and down constantly. So I was never even getting sustained uh, clocks under extreme loads. That was back when I was still thought I had to use Prime ninety five to test everything. But anyway. Who knows what's really going on? I just I wish they were honest with the reporting on this stuff, or maybe accurate is a better word. Yeah, and I will say regarding the Tom's article, a lot of bigger publications they don't let the authors write the headlines because uh, this article was written by Paul Alcorn, who's a longtime industry guy. Uh, I've only met him a few times throughout our my you know my time here, but he seems like a good guy. I, I don't he doesn't seem the kind of guy who would intentionally stoke hysteria for clicks. So maybe that was a case of an editor tweaking a headline to make it more enticing. Um, so shame on Tom's editorially, uh, but, you know, Paul, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and then also, I, I neglected to mention, uh, this all started not just because of the Hardware Info and the uh, Tom's article. That was based upon a post over on the Hardware Info forums by a user named The Stilt. And he's got, he was the one who, who initially uh, identified the issue and showed where, where it's going into the Hardware Info, like where you can see this on your own board. We'll have a link to his his post that kicked all this off uh, as well. And if you want to check to see if yours, if you're just curious, like I said, it's not a big deal. You can get the latest version of hardware info and you look for the power uh, reporting deviation setting. And if it's below 100, 100% means it's telling the, the board is telling the processor the actual amount. Below that is where this deviation comes into play. So play around with that on your own. But, uh, you know, Josh has to leave to go to work this evening, unfortunately. So, Josh, any, anything else you want to add before you head out? No, I think that's pretty much about it. Okay, so we're going to take a break here. We're going to say uh, goodbye to Josh. And, uh, you know, if you're, an, you know, you're an employer out there and you're looking for an employee like Josh who's going to go overnight, middle of the night on a weekday, and do security patches and updates, uh, that is dedication. And I, uh, and I could use a raise. Thanks. Well, <laughs> It's all about finding the right people for the job. And speaking of finding the right people for the job, we're going to take a break to hear from our sponsor this week. Today's sponsor is LinkedIn Jobs, an incredibly powerful yet easy-to-use platform for finding the best job candidates to meet your company or organization's needs. Now more than ever, we need people with the right skills to support our communities, especially the frontline workers who provide resources and care for those most in need. To help, LinkedIn is offering free job posts for healthcare and essential service organizations that need to quickly fill critical roles with the people who help us all. If you're hiring for one of these organizations, job posts on LinkedIn can help you quickly find the right people for your front line. LinkedIn Jobs leverages the existing LinkedIn business network and its more than 675 million members to help you screen candidates for the skills and experiences you're looking for. It puts your job post in front of only the most qualified people and helps you fill that open role fast, which is especially important for jobs in critical roles. To post a healthcare or essential service job for free, or if you're in another industry and have hiring needs, just visit linkedin.com slash pcper. Again, that's linkedin.com slash pcper. Terms and conditions apply. We thank LinkedIn Jobs for its support of the PC Perspective podcast. And we're back. So let's continue on with the show. We've got next up a review from Sebastian. Uh, he's looking at the uh, Radeon uh, Navi-based uh, RX 5600 XT. This is a, a special version, though. This is the uh, from XFX. It's the RX 5600 XT Thick 2 Pro. And uh, he says it's the 14 gigabit difference. Uh, and that, of course, is the, uh, the big differentiator. The controversy around these cards is the, the difference in memory speed. So... 
Sebastian, tell us what uh, what you find with this card. First of all, can you believe that this was announced this year? It feels like a year ago. I can't. I was looking at the date. Like, really? This I did this review on January twenty first. Back then, if you can throw your mind back to CES twenty twenty, it was a different place, a different time. And AMD gets on stage and they announce the fifty six hundred XT. They're kind of filling out the Navi product stack and this is going to be their 1080p enthusiast gaming product in fact they said on stage like the the big slide up on the stage was ultimate 1080p gaming so you're thinking wow this is going to be great performance navi was a good performer and this is a lower price point 1080p targeted this is great and then i think it was the next day it was during this time frame at ces that evga and NVIDIA steal the show because they make their announcement of the RTX 2060 KO or knockout edition, which they priced coincidentally at 279 And that's what AMD had announced the 5600 XT at. So the 5600 XT was going to be going up against the GTX 16 series. And suddenly here NVIDIA was, at least on paper, EVGA offering this KO edition card. We'll just forget about the fact that it was available for just a, a blink of an eye and it went right up to like 300 plus. But that was that's the picture. So what does AMD do? What can they do? They can either reduce their price to be more competitive, which is what they've always had to do, or they can be very aggressive. And I, I think of this as something that's going to make a really interesting chapter or part of a chapter in a book someday. Like, And then the phone call came in. And they had to scramble. And it was, how high can we push the GPU clocks on these boards that are already made, on coolers that already have been designed for lower GPU clocks and lower temps? How far can we push the memory? Some of these boards that were out there were only specced with 12 gigabit per second memory because that's the specification that AMD had given their partners. And then they were all being asked last minute to overclock their memory with what amounts to a pretty hefty 24-7 memory overclock XFX was one of the the few. In fact, I think they were the only one who didn't have any cards at all at launch. Maybe MSI also, but uh, regardless, they were left out there with uh, the choice to make. Like, do we push cards too far that can't support this? Or do we just do the GPU overclock like we're being asked to and leave memory alone? So when I first looked at an XFX Radeon 5600 XT, it was just woefully underperforming compared to that initial review unit that I had that AMD had sent us. So of course we got a timely BIOS update and it was all ready to go with the fast GPU clocks and the fast memory. And I was under the impression as I was writing that review that all cards were going to receive this, only finding out subsequently, oh no, no, not every vendor is going to actually do this and not every card will get this support. So instantly the market became fragmented And I said in my initial review of an XFX card, like this isn't XFX's fault. They had already shipped boards. There were boards in retail packaging in warehouses with 12 gigabit per second memory on them. So they they were in a very awkward place. So this is kind of the relaunch. AMD, in fact, I think they did a soft relaunch announcement last month, early last month, about the 14 gigabit per second Radeon 5600 XT. That's just the new standard. All the new cards coming out have this faster memory. XFX has a whole line of cards now that actually have 14 gigabit per second in the name or in the product string, so you know. But nothing astonishing here. I mean, if you look at the review on the site, you're going to see performance significantly better in all, every case but one. The outlier was... Okay, what was it? Uh, I think it was Star Control. There was some game. Yeah, it was Star Control. Where for whatever reason, I guess it wasn't as bandwidth, like memory bandwidth constrained. So the faster clocks of the Thick 3 Ultra actually allowed it to outperform the Thick 2 Pro. And the Thick 3 Ultra, by the way, that even though that was a 12 gigabit per second card that I reviewed, the GPU core clock was like 100 megahertz faster. Uh, did you overclock the uh, thick two? No, 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 not yet. I just did basic okay. benchmarking. 
So it's it's possible they can hit those prices or the those clocks because this is like a pricing segmentation thing. I'm sure the cooler is smaller though, so I think that was part of it because even at these much lower GPU clocks under load, I was hitting 80 degrees. So that I mean it's not super high. We know Navi can go a lot higher than that. The 5700 series can go to 100 plus, but it it was a lot warmer than that big triple fan cooler on the uh thick three ultra was so there that was another one of those things like this whole launch also threw a, a wrench into the works for cooler design because they were boards out there with coolers that just couldn't sustain the higher clocks because they were using lighter weight heat sinks and that sort of thing but this one seems to be fine the heat pipes on it are pretty big and it's it's using a lot of copper so i should try overclocking it but as it was, just out of the box, it used a little bit less power than that Thick 3 Ultra. So the added memory speed and lower GPU clocks, it didn't quite even out, but it was a little bit lower power draw. Very quiet, though. Just like the Thick 3 Ultra, they use a very, very quiet fan profile. It maxed out at 44% on the fans under a sustained load. Like I, I've been doing this thing where I put the Metro Exodus benchmark on Ultra and just have it run constantly. You can put in as many iterations as you want. And it maxed out at 80 degrees on the hot spot in a room that was only about 19C. So, and the memory was at 72C. And the, the noise, I was just talking about noise, noise maxed out at 35 decibels. In fact, it would only sort of spike to 35 and then it would kind of even out. And it, when it would even out, it was always at 33. So very, very quiet card. You're not going to hear this card over most uh, CPU air coolers. So if if you're interested in one of these GPUs, initially I was not going to give any kind of recommendation for these because I felt like they were overpriced. The list price on this particular card is $299. So you're already looking at something that's $20 above the price level of AMD's like any AMD's like launch target price, the 279 list price. But there are cards that are less than that. In fact, you can buy a card. I think it's the ASRock card for 269 that has 14 gigabit memory enabled. So I think in answer to this and just looking at the market, they made the right choice because both Amazon and Newegg now have this card at a, just an instant $20 off. So at 279 which is the list price for this GPU, you're getting a very quiet cooler and basically what I consider baseline performance for a 5600 XT with 14 gigabit per second memory. So it, if you compare it head to head with an RTX 2060, it still does not win. It might win a test here and there, like if you're you, like star controls Vulcan. So if you have a Vulcan game, AMD is always going to win at about the same price level, at least in my testing. But other games, it's back and forth, but more often than not, the RTX 2060 wins. And that's not a super, that's just the standard RTX 2060. So it all it's it literally comes down to if your preference is AMD or if you find a good deal on one, which is, you know, it's kind of sad. Like if this had been a $250 card, it would be a lot easier to say, oh yeah, absolutely. And I'm not even getting into driver issues. And it, I, I feel like a lot of the negative reviews that are out there, if you look on places like Newegg, and Amazon are focused on driver issues and not actually talking about the hardware. So just looking at the hardware itself, I didn't have any complaints about this card. And I think they took care of the pricing issue already. So I gave it the silver award because, you know, it's it's good, but there are conditions and it's not the absolute best performance you can get for your dollar right now. All right. So if you can find it at twenty seven or $279, but not at the 299 List price, right? Oh yeah, two ninety nine was too much for this card, but it was two seventy nine at Amazon, and it was two ninety nine with an instant twenty dollar off code on Newegg this morning. Yeah. So, all right, and heck, yeah, step. Right. Let's let's move uh, from looking at a card that we know about here to a uh, some speculation. We know a- Nvidia is coming up with their Ampere uh, based cards. The assumption is that they're going to go to the RTX three thousand series, and uh, we had a number of leaks in the last uh, few days here of what this card might look like. It started with a picture of the, the shroud. Uh, it was uh, leaked over on chip hell, video cards uh, picked it up and uh, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
uh, curated. They curated a bunch of the rumors. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, uh, wing. It's basically been corroborated at this point. I don't think it's even really a rumor anymore. Well, it, at the point when this first came out, well, it was... NVIDIA's okay. doing oh, an sure, investigation, yeah. so... I, it, yes. yeah. it looked too good. I mean, with the, the plastic wrap on it and all that, it looked too this legit. This was iPhone 4 left in a bar level detail here. This was yeah, Gizmodo that. level. Gizmo. Yeah. Gizmodo yeah. leak level. So it's it's exactly. it's a allegedly a design for the new RTX 3080 uh, Founders Edition entry you know first not entry level but first released card reference design uh, for this this upcoming series and it's a very unique design it's got uh, it's not not blower which is good uh, but it's got these staggered fans so you've got one uh, on the front like t- towards the ports on the bottom and then one on the top that's towards the back uh, so you know interesting design to see how that would you know efficiently move air and making sure that if there is one part of your case that's blocked that all the fans won't be blocked You'll, you should have at least one fan that's got good airflow coming to it uh so a very interesting design there um you know i, I i've it's grown on me a little bit it, it, we've only got these these uh clandestine pictures with the protective film still on and everything but at first i thought oh that's weird but it's the design's kind of grown on me what do you guys think it's a bow tie yep yeah. I'm sorry, that's exactly the first thing I saw, too. But you'll never look at it like that. Or I guess, well, if you've got a vertical... Bow ties are cool. But <laughs> sure. I, I know I'm kind of a weird person, but I liked it immediately. Like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's something different. Tech- I like the idea of the fans on opposite sides. I'm just curious how it's no. going to work, what kind of performance it'll have, Te- where it's throwing all the speaking, hot air. Exactly. It looks like that they're trying to take advantage of all of the fin stack they possibly can by flowing the air through one side across the middle and then out the backside or and that will be upwards towards where the cpu cavity normally is you know to try and maybe take advantage of normal case flow so it may not be visually attractive but at least it's thermally cognizant and, and just like with people who complain about amd's graphics card design the you, does another that? blower, like when the, the 5700 <laughs> series came out, you, third parties are going to use their own coolers, guys. Don't worry oh, about yeah. it. If you don't like the Founders Edition, guess what? You probably weren't a Founders Edition buyer anyway. Exactly. Guess what Asus's cooler is going to look like. Go ahead. Think about it. Yeah. But look at their current ones. You know what the new ones are going to look like. They're going to repurpose <laughs> sure. them if they possibly can. Well, the and PCB although, shape is weird. I don't know, the, the different PCB thing. Yeah, it's going to require yeah. some it's, new tools. It's short. Yes. It's short. And well, it's no, sort they're, of, they're trying to tell us it, it's got a wedge in it. It's like, got a V in you, it, yeah. Why? Cut it off short. Why, do you actually tracing components all the way out to Be, these little fins? Because it costs more. <laughs> There's something to be said to, for that premium pricing model. To route traces on an angle like that. Like, seriously, it, it's perfect, right? Or a nice little staircase pattern. It doesn't get well, I mean, if, if, that's what they need, if that's what they need to do to ensure the airflow is adequate, because uh, we've also heard rumors that the top end of these cards could be 350, 390 watts, a lot of power that they're going to be putting through these to, to maintain their performance lead. So, you know, a, a custom PCB might be the, how the only way they could fit into a somewhat standard form factor uh, for the overall. That design. I guess, except, but that weird of a shape yeah Yeah, but thermally okay think about like put aside how it looks and think about like okay hey instead of like trying to suck all the air from against the glass or against the bottom of where like the 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 power supply shroud might be and stuff like that let's do something interesting and let's push that hot air up into a space that is already being evacuated by normal case flow yeah it's in theory it's a theory it's it might work and with most of the PSUs being bottom mounted on the higher end cases, with or yeah, without a shroud that to separate not, them. Yeah, exactly. A lot of it, you know, it depends on, you know, I'm not sure if it matters a whole lot, but a lot of guys, you know, they'll mount the, and women will, will mount, will mount it, uh, the power supply with the uh, co- right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't want to be discriminatory. You know, there, everyone can be mounted. Oh, cold yeah. air intake or or case intake could be either way works either way yeah. i'm curious to see how it work because i've never seen a video card in memory set up like that i can't think of a device that was set up like that 
it's it's going to be a unique design. It'll be it'll be interesting to see how this this comes to play. But as, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, you know, when, when this when those leaks first appeared, they were just there. We didn't have any way to uh, corroborate uh, uh, corroborate them. But then there was a, a second uh, subsequent report uh, that Nvidia has. They were pissed about this that their own product managing people didn't even know what these designs were until they showed up on Reddit and Twitter. Uh, and so Nvidia has allegedly also launched an internal investigation to figure out where this leak came from. And they're looking, uh, according to this report, uh, they're looking at uh, uh, Foxconn and BYD, uh, two of Nvidia's hardware partners, uh, mm. to see if those that's where the, the leak originated. So uh, Jensen's not happy. Well, we'll have to wait and see uh, what else develops there. And of course, if they're going to have this very aggressive design, very aggressive uh, uh, power levels that have been suggested, then those hoping for a those hoping that prices will return to reality on the high end might Mm -mm. be disappointed lies it'll be the (laughs) 1999 is the new the new uh top of the line enthusiast price point we'll see but uh another uh article here we've talked about uh this a couple weeks ago we well not this particular story but we talked about the 80s canyon nook which was the uh very interesting collaboration between uh, amd and, and intel or a uh, the Cabby Lake G processor, which was an Intel processor with integrated Vega uh, AMD graphics. And it was a very short-lived product. It, it, it performed really well for the time, but it was a strange marriage, a lot of uh, controversy over who was going to support it. And uh, Intel gave up. They Even despite saying they were going to support it for, I think, five years, they came out and said, we're, now we're done. So AMD, you're in charge of graphics drivers for this thing. And... Uh, that lasted uh, a couple of months, and now AMD has pulled the graphics drivers, the adrenaline drivers they were delivering to these Cabby Lake G systems due to compatibility issues. And there's, uh, from the last time, last update I saw, there was no, no time frame for a resolution, but obviously with Windows 10 2004 rolling out and graphics drivers being updated to be uh, compatible or at least optimally compatible with that, uh, it's not a good time to, to give the at least 12 people who run one of these systems, a, uh, you know, a, a delay in terms of their, their driver updates. But so just, just a heads up there. If you're running one hey, of those nooks, do you think they're just bitter because this was basically, they were paying for the courtship between Raja and Intel back then. Cause you know, he was very closely involved, obviously being head of Radeon technology group at the time with the implementation yeah. of Radeon graphics on Intel processors. And the next thing you know, Oh, he's jumping ship to Intel, and there's like you know one of his coworkers had gone fairly recently. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it was just imagine, just think about this. in In ten years, we'll look back on this. I even look back on it now. Like, can you believe there was an Intel processor with an AMD graphics chip? It just it doesn't it boggles the mind. Yeah, which was then dumped to the side of the curb like a prom night baby. Well, it didn't suck a lot. Oh, no, it didn't. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that neither parent oh. really wanted anything to do with it after yeah. it, they proved that it happened. It was a unique form factor. It was, uh, at the time, and for a long time after its launch, the most powerful in that class in terms of power usage and size uh, because it, you know AMD did really good graphics, and, and Intel at that point was still ahead in the, on the CPU side. So, yeah, but it just, no, it was just, yeah. It was that weird pre-then era. Like, hey, what if we put AMD's mobile graphics onto a CPU that doesn't suck? What would that be like? (laughs) And then Zen comes out. They're like, we don't need you anymore. We can put out our own APUs. Well, I think it it launched after Zen. We we got Z, Z, Z. Exactly. I don't think it launched after Zen, did it? I thought it did. I'm going to challenge I think it did. on that one. Okay, well, I think it's launched okay. after Zen. That's so weird. Well, it was developed. Yeah, but not I... I don't know. First gen Zen. All right, so uh, first gen Ryzen launched, launched early 2017, like February, March yeah. 2017. Okay, all right. This wasn't until 2018. Was That's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. Well, sort of. All right, well, let's, let's finish up the last baked. couple stories here. We've got uh, okay. the... That we've talked about the consoles because the next gen Xbox and PlayStation are both going to be running the the same basic uh, AMD architecture. They're implementing it quite differently. We've talked about that before. Uh, up until this week, I think it was even today, 
we knew what the specs were. We knew what the expected performance level was in a general sense. We knew what the Xbox looked like. But we didn't know what the PlayStation, the PS5 was going to look like. And they oh, no. came out today and oh boy, uh, it's, it's, mm. it's different. I mean, the Xbox Series X is, is different. Maybe I've just gotten used to it now. It's more of like a mini fridge, compact little tower thing. And this is a very different design from uh, Sony. They're going to have two different versions. There's going to be the uh, one with an optical drive, which will be a UHD uh, uh, Blu-ray disc for those bigger games that are still delivered on disc. And then if you're all digital, they're going to have the uh, a presumably a cheaper model, like Microsoft does, that omits the, uh, the optical drive entirely. No pricing. No pricing for any of these companies yet. That's, they're playing chicken, waiting to see who will blink first so that they can undercut each other. But uh, here it is. There's the PlayStation 5 design. And uh, there's a. It just looks a, like Stormtrooper armor. Slide, it I've, looks I've, even worse. I've got to confirm my birthday to watch the promo video. Uh oh. Uh oh. No, I, I got to tell you that it, the entire thing looks like tech from the Oblivion movie with Tom Cruise. I liked that leaked, rendered version. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, that and was much better looking, get, wasn't it? We get this. Wait, they're going back to the cell architecture? What the hell? Oh, no. <laughs> oh. No, not cell. Not cell. <laughs> we said go back to the drawing board. We, no, we it's not cell. Part. It's RDNA. Oh, that's mm. just creepy. It's like alien what invasion sort of stuff. So it's... Yeah, the it's, results may vary. Are they testing speakers? What's going on yeah, here? Let's get to a, uh, a point where we actually get to see something. Our advanced there we grill go. cloth. You will not usually be invaded eyes. by alien goo. <laughs> So like like Microsoft, it's going to be a tower style design. It's going to be taller than it is wide. Uh, we know Microsoft has said you could set the Xbox Series X on its side. Uh, I assume they're. I, I did not see specific, uh, specifically that for this PS5. I, I imagine they might they might offer that as well because that that'll if you're in a, a small place and you've got to stick something into an entertainment center, you may not have the height to put this thing. On your shelf, you may have exactly. to turn it sideways. It, yeah, I saw. I, mean, that's I think part of the, the point. Verge showed it in its horizontal orientation okay. on their article today. <sighs> so there it is, the PS5. We've got that that piece of the puzzle there, and now we've just got to figure out what this stuff's going to cost and uh, and see how their approaches to using this <laughs> AMD platform pay off. <laughs> oh yes, and our Discord community is. Uh, Oh wow! Oh yeah, they're they're doing really good. <laughs> they're they're coming in hot with the, uh, the photoshops. Look at, this, look at the cable modem with the two pieces of typing paper up against it, or whatever these are. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, some, I mean, some of these are I've seen these earlier, but I the cable I modem to with look. the wings really got good. me. It's like two envelopes. The un the underwear one, one was really good, actually. Yeah, <laughs> you know, came earlier today. If you're not already. Uh, a member of our Discord community. You're missing Use out. The link in the You're missing out. Notes. You really are. Join You're missing us. out. All right. Well, if you're in, you know, I don't, I don't know how much the look of the console will actually matter to that many people. It's, it's going to be how, how it <laughs> no, looks. Look, there's a reason and... that Sony and other companies have always done a light color scheme, like a champagne or white in Japan, and then when they bring it over to the U.S., it's always just matte black. Because their understanding is that the U.S. market thinks that black represents a more expensive, sleek living room component. And you don't like if you wanted the white PS4, I think that was a limited edition or like a Japan only console. Previous versions of the PlayStation have had like special limited edition color schemes that we didn't necessarily get here. So it, I just look at this and say, is this really only going to be available in white or will we have that like traditional black because you know i mean the later generation one there'll be a ps5 mini and that'll just be like you know plain abs plastic but well both consoles for the last three generations have all offered customizable skins and designs throughout their lifetime oh no yeah there'll be stickers for this won't there be yeah oh i think so oh, of course full all body right. decal kits Yep. Final Based story. The drawings I've seen. Final story. Let's uh, wrap this train wreck up. Uh, we've got uh, <laughs> the, the game that keeps on giving, No Man's Sky, the oh, no. game that launched controversially no. years ago. You mean with, taking? Like, you mean well, taking? No, I mean, I'm amazed. I mean, it's really the only thing that they've got that this studio has, so they've got to do it on one hand. But on the other hand, this was a game that launched to universal hatred because it didn't meet any of its uh, expectations upon release in 2000. 
what, 16, late 16, early 17? It's been years. <sighs> Oh, and they continued, I don't even continued to add to the game. Now, you still may not like it. At the core, it's still the same basic game, in which some people just don't like. It's, it's kind of slow. I've, I've heard a lot of people like it. They liken it to something that if you get uh, high on pot and you want to relax, you can enjoy, enjoy this experience, that kind of thing. It's not an action-first <laughs> thing. But they've continued. They've had multiple major updates. They've added tons of functionality to it. And uh, this, uh, this week, they announced that they're coming out with an additional uh, or a new update that's going to bring cross-play multiplayer. So PS4, Windows, Xbox, uh, you can you can play. There are some restrictions there in terms of like numbers of players, uh, but there will be cross-play multiplayer, and it's coming to Game Pass both for uh, Windows and Xbox. So it's part of that Windows Game Pass thing that uh, is is more recent. So if you're on a Windows gamer and you've never played this before and you have Game Pass, you can check it out. Uh, I believe Microsoft is still running that deal where you get uh, if you're a first-time subscriber, you can get like three months of Game Pass for a dollar or something. It's like a real cheap deal. So there's another reason to, to check it out. Uh, I, I It's not my favorite game, but I've played it and I've enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't start playing it until several updates into the game. Um, and it's 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 just kind of incredible to see this kind of support from a non-service game. I just, you just don't, I, I don't think I've seen this in any other, uh, in any other uh, context where a non-service game was this continually well, except updated. anything that comes from Paradox. But, but those are they're selling you those updates. Those are DLC that they charge twenty dollars for a piece. Every single one of their DLCs comes with a free game changing update as well. Yes, you get a good chunk of the DLC if you don't want to pay for it. That is true. Uh, but uh, they're but the point is they're gen- they're getting revenue from those that work. They're doing Fair. The work no, I get your point. Sorry. Yeah. But all right, I'll um, have to see if I can uh, find a deal on that someday because never played it. Well, the direct competitor Elite has also been pretty regular in releasing uh, updates. Some of which have been well received. Uh, some of which have uh, been pay for play. I still okay, I'm not, haven't fired that thing up yet. I really need to. I'm not a big Elite yeah. player, but I imagine you just pissed some people off by calling Elite Dangerous a competitor to no Man's did. Sky because Elite's I very. Did. Oh God, yeah. Very technical, complicated, more real world, you know, realistic, and yeah. But you land on planets and wander around, and you can get out now. There's aliens. Okay, yeah. yeah, you don't want to get out though, considering and what's I, going on right now. I will say uh, yet again, I'm I've <laughs> never been get out of the ship. <laughs> uh, Mirror PPC in our Discord is reminding me that there are examples of games that are well updated, well supported, and he listed Terraria and Starbound. So uh, yes, there are. I guess there are games that are out there. Um, Oh, good really lord! Remember, are either of those? Spore is on sale right now. Speaking of games, oh, <laughs> apparently that's still a thing. That did you? That was did fun. You bring up I am bread earlier. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's in my library. Okay, yeah, all right. it's not an easy game, man. It's, it's bloody hard. No, it did not look easy or fun. <laughs> or well, fun is funny. That's what I was wondering about. <laughs> I'd watch somebody else stagger through it while drinking heavily but that's about seemed it. like there wasn't a lot of fun involved but i was going to ask you about that it, it, it's i mean as long as you accept the fact that you're never going to make it to the bloody plate in an edible condition <laughs> it becomes freaking amusing well, well goat simulator just, like yeah goat goat simulator at least it was fun to just bash into things you didn't really have to well that's no how bowl. you treat i am bread i see you just <laughs> Okay, well, let's get into our picks of the week. Before Josh left us earlier, he left a pick for us. Uh, it's... Well, I stuck it in there because oh, it had that? to okay. go. All right, so there's a... Well, then why don't you uh, tell us, Jeremy, what's what's the pick well, for Josh? Yeah. We all know that Josh uh, does virtual racing leagues and is, you know, very, very involved in it and always looking for new people. So Humble today just launched the perfect Josh Tech bundle. You can get your hands on all of the games that Josh loves from grid to dirt, dirt two, uh, a couple that he hasn't, I don't think played, uh, in that, uh, was it F1 in 2019? It's dirt cheap for dirt four. So if you're interested, give it a shot. Um, if you played the original operation flashpoint, don't play dragon rising. It it's a shit game. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it, it's wonderful because you start the game and then a sniper or AI controlled from two and a half kilometers away kills you and you start again. The original Operation Flashpoint was a much better and very interesting uh, sort of military sim game like Arma, but before then. 
and done, I believe, by the same guys as Arma. So yeah, if you're wanting to do it, click on it. For 15 bucks, you can get just about every racing game you'll want to play. And then you can quickly drop Josh an email or a Twitter comment, and he'll probably set you up on his racing league. All right. So that's the uh, the Humble Codemasters Bundle 2020. It's in effect for the next 20 days as we're recording this. So plenty of time uh, for you guys to run out and grab that. So let's see who's next. It's uh, Jeremy. You're next with your official pick. Yes, I I actually had a couple, but this is just ridiculous. Um, Itch.io, if you haven't run into it before, is a platform for independent gamer or game developers to produce their stuff. Uh, a good chunk of it is not wonderful. A lot of it is actually amusing. This is one a bundle that they put up, and they've just been having people continually contributing. Uh, it was originally 1,500 games plus or minus. The current count is over 1,600, and it's five bucks. Yes, there will be a fair amount of stuff that you're never going to play, but come on. The better part of 1,600 games or 1,700 games for five dollars, and a lot of them are going to be kid friendly and stuff. So just grab it. Y- you can download the EXEs as long as itch.io exists, which, you know, it's been around for quite a while. And, you know, they, give all the money away anyway so win-win all right yeah, that's do you guy. understand what my steam library looks like now for playtime do you understand mm-hmm. yeah oh my god this this may be because i've got everything you do and i am bread i know i this, don't have i am bread this may be too much i think like this might be overwhelming for five dollars getting all of these games but yeah. uh, well and the nice thing is they send you an email with links to download it so if you log into your account it's not like it's suddenly flooded with all of these titles and you have to try and scroll through to get them. Uh, in this case, it's just as you activate them, they might pop up. But yeah, seriously, it's it's 1,637 games. For $5. Yeah. At, at regular price, you're looking at over $9,000 in entertainment value, which is a 99 wow. plus percent discount rate, folks. So, all right, check that out. The bundle for racial justice and equality at itch.io. And, uh, We'll uh, have a link to that in the show notes. And next up is Brett. What have you got for us? Well, I was looking for a replacement um, device to kind of handle networking duties around the house. And that would be like VMs, uh, maybe uh, VPN, which I've got running on a Ubiquity box right now. File serving, backup services for uh, machines in the house and remote as well as um, something that's Synology-like, but more tweakable. So I was looking at Unraid platform and things like that, and then what do I stick this thing in? What kind of case does this thing need? And I sort of looked around, and I didn't see anything that was really great until I stumbled across um, this one from Silverstone, which is just about to be released, and it looks great. It's got a a mini, uh, or not mini, micro uh, ATX case, Big fan in the front, hot swap. It's got room for seven plus one, seven plus one in micro ATX uh, case, uh, room for internal drives. That is just a really efficient use of internal space. Plenty of room for a full size graphics card if you need it, reasonable airflow. Um, it's just really a really nice case to bring in if you want to be. Not a huge, ha, not have a huge footprint for your Unraid server or Proxmox or FreeNAS or something like that. This is just about to be released from Silverstone. They haven't priced it yet or whatnot, but it looks like it's going to be a great case. I'd be really stoked to to review this. I know case reviews are silly sometimes, but I'd, I'd be happy to review it. I'm going to build one. All right, so that's the Silverstone CS330 case, as Brett said, coming out uh, uh, imminently here. So you may not be able to find it. Any hint on the price? Very soon. Silverstone generally doesn't make things that are tremendously cheap. That's what I'm thinking, right? It's It's probably going to be a bit pricey. plus. Well, I'm thinking mid twos. Okay. All right, now, Sebastian, I'm going to give you- Because it's micro. I'm going to give Sebastian an opportunity here to respond to the statement Brett just made uh, that case reviews are silly. What do you think of that? Case reviews are largely just opinion. 
But I, I think you can spend way too much freaking time on a case review to make it actually useful to people if you're worried about how does it do with liquid cooling? Uh, how does it do with air cooling? Well, what about with a blower graphics card? What about what the aftermarket graphic card? And it's just, it becomes too much. But I am confident in my ability to review a case after more than seven years of experience doing so. I can very quickly judge it based on its overall build quality. And honestly, I wasn't listening to what Brett was saying, so I have no idea why I'm being asked to talk about case reviews right now. Okay. All I want to say is this Silverstone case has room behind the motherboard for extensive cabling. That's all I want to say. Okay. That's what matters. I mean, well, it's, it's got yeah, the tray. 17 got millimeters the... is not enough. And, I like how this and has a it, tray. That's old school, man. And a, I yeah. know it's this actually checks a lot of boxes for like, hey, this is a cool home server oh, box. It's this one. It's this one. Okay. They're mm-hmm. reusing the Temgen TJ08E chassis. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Right? So in, in, instead of the optical drive bay up top, I looked at this one. You have three removable uh, hard drive trays, hot swap trays. So that's a 180 millimeter fan up front, unless they're using a smaller yes. one now. Uh, I think it might but, be smaller, but it's still that, a reasonable fan. You still got that 3.5. The reason the Temgen is so cool, you could you could potentially even repurpose one of those for like a baby AT system. It's got five and a quarter up top yeah. for your, you know, or five and a quarter inch floppy drive or your CD-ROM. And it's got a 3.5 millimeter external bay down at the bottom which you can use for yes. a hot swap tray or you can use it for your floppy yep. drive so i mean there's a lot of uh, possibilities with or, that case or your ssd boot cache drive down there partitioned appropriately and then your <clears throat> then your three hot swaps up top yeah. now i put my money where my mouth was from About last one? week's pick no well it this isn't available yet but i did buy some 12 terabyte drives from owc last week so you know the plan is eventually when this one comes out to populate those 12 terabytes in that upper area and fill out with some leftover fours that I've got in my current file server. You really can't go wrong with the Silverstone case. I, I was a Silverstone case it's, fan before it's good I quality. a review. I, I had a Fortress FTO2 case when I was busy overclocking my 5870s back in the day. And that moved a ton of air. It had 380 millimeter fans at the bottom and just it had that rotated orientation like the original raven case was it's oh back solid, in the days of the obnoxious solid. fans so you can you can actually yeah. sense why i'm like thrilled to see this case and i'm like oh this is the perfect home like nas server kind of network appliance kind of kind of thing it's got plenty of seven plus one internal drive capacity and room for a reasonable micro uh, uh, mini uh, micro ATX case so I can have a RAID controller and my graphics card if I want to do a pass through and to my VMs I, I'm excited about it all and right it so that's, that is seems a, a little ridiculous but well now you have to do some content when you get this thing and you put it together we have to have a all right an article or a video review or something so you're on the hook I'll do unraid on it unraid uh, okay Sebastian, can you build a PC in your pick? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can build a number of PCs in there. Each one of those trays will hold a motherboard. Uh, it can't be a very big motherboard. But I did discover, we're talking about a 10-drawer a plastic storage tower. A Big Ben, but not Big Ben. It's a, it's a black plastic thing. And I will say, Extremely very impressed stable. with the quality. Because they, they ship these things without any padding, just in a box exactly the size of the unit without feet. So I was a little worried, opened it up, and absolutely no damage to either of these. I bought two of them on Amazon, and the plastic that they use is very strong. I've had plastic containers where like, you have to go through three or four of them in the store to find the one that doesn't have a broken corner, and these are very rugged. Whatever that material is that they're using has a little bit of give to it, so they, they handle impact well. I'm trying to remember the name of the brand. So is it like I know ABS they're made in the USA. Or- I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it has just that little bit of give to it, like the nicer Rubbermaid stuff does. The Iris not USA. EBT. They make a lot of this stuff, and it's made in the USA. If that matters to you, the quality does seem to be very high. I think I paid 59 or $55. The price keeps on going up and down. But for something this big, imagine two of the usual kind of like Sterilite stacking or stackable towers but this this unit does not stack it's it's just 10 drawers high and i'm i've got like a drawer of ram and a 
probably two drawers worth of vintage CPUs and a drawer of modern CPUs. In fact, I discovered that a full size, like a full length um, processor tray will fit, will just fit into these drawers. So that's handy. But yeah, I, a very good way to get organized and they have a bunch of different sizes and heights. I just, I went for the 10 drawer just to get it over with. They have a four drawer, they have a seven drawer, they have different orientations of, of things. I recommend it. The fact that two of them survive ground shipping with no padding tells me that they're going to be durable. Well, that's the, uh, the Iris USA uh, storage cart with organizer top. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. I'll finish up real quick here. I think I've talked about this before uh, as like a, maybe a pick of the week or something, but uh, Flash is event, you know, the long death of Flash. It's it's coming to an end, December thirty first, twenty twenty, end of this year. Flash will be end of life, and it's already a pain in the butt to use it if you need to. Uh, you know, Chrome and and uh, Edge and Firefox they turn it off by default. You've got to have site settings to make it work reliably. Uh, now, there's a bunch of reasons you need Flash, but one of them is is games. And instead of having all these, because the, the there was a whole generation of Flash games that are part of like internet culture, strong, bad, and stuff like that. There's parts that are, uh, uh, were just creative, uh, like the first creative efforts of people who went on to do more mainstream games. And we're going to lose that unless we, we can protect it when flash goes away. And there's this project called the blue Maxima flashpoint project. And it is a collection of flash games. Uh, there's thousands of them and you can get it, uh, in, in one of two ways you can do the, uh, let's see what do they call it? The infinity version, which is only about two gigs. And it downloads the games on demand, like as you call for them, or you can get the ultimate version, which bundles all the games in and it runs flash uh, locally. So you don't need to have flash installed in your browser. You don't need to open yourself up to the security and compatibility and performance uh, impacts that does. This allows you to, to have uh, the games. And here's like a, an example. They, they it has a launcher. So that all the games are sorted and, and they're by release date and genre. There's hacked games in there. So like cheats that were programmed into the, original code. And it's just a really interesting way to go back. And I mean, um, some of our audience may have missed this, but I was like in high school, late high school and into college when flash games were the biggest thing in the world. And so there's a bunch of like nostalgic stuff that's in here that you can go and revisit. Uh, so we'll have a link to that. Check that out. If you want to maintain access to those flash games without having flash on your system. Uh, all right. Uh, well, that's the, that's the uh, show for this week. Uh, thanks everyone for for joining us. So uh, again, we record these on Wednesday or Thursday nights live, pcpro.com slash live, or you can catch them on demand at pcpro.com slash podcast. We have the show notes. We uh, the edited version, the final version has a sidebar that kind of lets you visually see what topic we're on, and it does all the YouTube uh, timestamp navigation and stuff. So it's easy to jump around and, and just see what you want to hear. Uh, but uh, we hope everyone uh, just has a great week. Uh, any any final th thoughts from you guys? Yeah, which version is more enjoyable? Which version? Yeah, edited well, like or the not edited? Because of the raw energy that we put forth. Mm -hmm. Jim does this whole, like, he tries to make it professional. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I think some of the magic is lost in the editing process. There is, we, we've definitely <laughs> had feedback from, from our audience who want the unedited version. Uh, the problem is, we've talked about this a lot, um, the majority of our audience still even today is, is audio only. Uh, I don't know if anybody's actually listening to these files, but they're being downloaded from our server every week into your podcast <laughs> catcher. And it's like five to one ratio of audio to video. And so I try to edit for are audio. You because are you telling me that there is an entertainment value to the audio that accompanies the stuff that's cut from the video version? I mean, wow. No. Well, sometimes there's but, magic there in, in the, the awkward pauses well, in, in the talking over one another. That's, it's not the that's, words we say. It's the words we don't say. Yeah. There there's is stuff that. in between sometimes there's talking over the, each the other. There's, pause. there's very awkward pauses. Uh, there's a lot of times where you guys talk about something for five minutes and you never say what you're talking about. True. And it's, true. it's on the screen. You can so interject. People, you can interject, Jim. I try. When you're driving. You, can you know, he like, does. Right. He does he try. Us off and say, All right, enough, 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 I, Alan, enough, Josh. And that's how it used to be. Yes, I do try to do that, but it doesn't always work. So I'm, I'm trying to edit for that. And then also there are some, sometimes, well, let's just put it this way. I, you know, you sometimes some things are said that I don't want to be associated with. So I cut that out. <laughs> 
because I, not not that I want to censor you. I think that's I'm exactly what you're describing, you Jim. Know us. I'm the Sounds party. Sounds like censorship. I'm the party listed on the lawsuit when it True. gets filed, and you guys. So this aren't, is the pro- so. this is the problem when ownership literally is the person editing the podcast. Yeah. The owner. There, there are many would argue that that's how it should be. I guess. But I if feel, you do, luck stops. I feel like I've been censored. I think I've, I, I know my place now. All right, we'll clean it up. It'll be NPR friendly. <laughs> Jim, I think maybe in a little while, like maybe in like a few months, you should just tally up who gets censored the most. There's enough. I'm shooting enough for that. It. I'm yeah. shooting for that. Okay. But it doesn't count if you're trying. Yeah, that could have unintended consequences. All right. Kick off something we don't want to talk about. I didn't about. actually swear this this time. Not yet. We're still not, haven't closed not, the show that's yet. That's There was nothing miracle. worth swearing about this year. I'm not like I'm not like there's, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, but there was nothing worth but swearing at like this week. Canadian swearing. You but, look my uh, back, eh? Well, so that's that's the reason. <laughs> but I will say, if you do want the unedited version, because we, we stream it live and Google automatically saves when you stream live to their platform, they save the full file including Ooh. like the awkward posts like when we're trying to set up our pre-show when we're trying to wait for everyone to get here you want to get that whole mess it's not edited it doesn't have a sidebar there's no timestamps. we do list that on our patreon uh so you can, well, you can either watch live and just save the url or if you're a patron you just member, can't get listed. enough of this just a, a little contribution to us to keep this nonsense going will get you unfettered access to the uncensored unrated version of the podcast Sure. It, that's, it's that's like getting a bonus DVD with your movie. A bonus. Yes. Watch the it's... theatrical version on our YouTube channel, the unlisted version. You never know what you might be missing. It's worth it. It's worth a few bucks a month, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, so uh, check that to out. To see and... Jeremy's backside as he reaches over his desk. I think I, think I left that in. I think that was. In you there. did. Was that okay. one. I think that's <laughs> in the un... that's in the recut version. I think. Yeah. 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 yeah it's in the special edition. All right. Well, with all that said, folks, uh, we do thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We hope you had a good time. And, uh, you know, come check out all the articles at PCPro.com and subscribe at PCPro.com slash subscribe if you do want to join the live stream. And in the show notes at Patreon, I'm sorry, at PCPro.com slash podcast, in the show notes, there's a link to our Discord as well and just to all the topics we talked about. Uh, so you can get uh, access there if you're not already uh, on that platform. But uh, until next week, everyone, we, uh, we're glad you could join us. We wish you all the best. Uh, take care of yourselves and your, and your families, and we'll see you next week. Bye.